Today I woke up to discover that the Pi Foundation has announced a new Raspberry Pi 5 line. Let's talk about what that means for hobbyists. Hey guys, it's Josh from the WL Tech Blog. Welcome to another video. So the Raspberry Pi Foundation sent me this Pi 5 for review. Ha, I wish that were the case, but sadly I'll just have to use information made available by the Pi Foundation themselves and other folks who are given review units. I'll include links to some of those in the description, so be sure to check them out for hands-on impressions. Now I've been using the Pi series since the original model. Like most hobbyists, I have to admit that a few of their boards just ended up taking up space in a drawer, as several of their popular use cases just didn't appeal to me. I don't have a television, so I didn't need a media player appliance. I don't play video games, so all the excellent emulation systems out there just don't appeal to me. But what I do like are Linux boxes. Currently, I've got a Pi 4 8 gig model running as a home server. Using Docker, I'm managing and monitoring my solar power system, running my 3D printer, home security cameras, and of course doing network file serving and lots of little jobs. Since I started using a MacBook Air as my primary compute device, the Pi 4 has been a great second device for when you really need a real Linux box. I'm also regularly using a Pi Top 3 which is a pretty complete laptop based on the Raspberry Pi 3. I'm always impressed at how well it does, considering how far behind the Pi 3 is, but lately I only get it out for programming flash chips or testing sketchy USB devices. I'm getting close to retiring this device, as it's getting harder and harder to justify. So the big news today is the introduction of the new Pi 5. All the big YouTube channels have them, and I've watched all the reviews while having my morning coffee. There's a lot new with the Pi 5, a lot to like, and maybe a few letdowns. Let's go over the things that really stood out to me. You can't really put off talking about the new processor. Pi was started by a few Broadcom employees, and they've always worked closely together over the years, which is good and bad. That relationship meant that Pi could get exactly the chip they wanted from Broadcom, but also limited them to just the technology that they already had on the shelf. Over time, this has improved, with Pi designing some of the support chips themselves, but the big pieces have always been right from Broadcom's inventory. This isn't all bad. Broadcom makes solid chips and can take a few years old ARM core and package it up for a great price. But that old tech is always what you're getting. Not to mention the GPU series used by all Pi models so far, Video Core, has a pretty poor history with the free software community. The new Pi 5 uses the Broadcom BCM2712 processor. Don't bother remembering that, because like the Pi 4's BCM2711, they're exclusive to Pi. What you do need to know is that the new chip is a 4-core, 64-bit ARM A76 unit, and it unsurprisingly is 2-4 to four times faster in CPU performance than the 4-year-old A72 chip of the Pi 4. The memory performance is also much better, using a newer LPDDR4X technology, resulting in more than twice the memory performance of the Pi 4. And this really is a trend with the new board. Everything is about twice as fast as it was on the Pi 4. A big new feature is the introduction of the RP1 chip, which essentially acts like a south bridge on a desktop PC motherboard. Most of the accessory and I.O. functions are handled by the RP1 rather than the CPU directly, which was a major bottleneck on the Pi 4. Frustratingly, you still only get two USB 3.0 ports, but now they're on separate controllers and can deliver the full 5 gigabit speeds at the same time. You also get two USB 2 ports, which to me seems like a miss. More on that later. The RP1 is connected to the processor with a 4x PCIe link and it provides the interfaces for USB 3, USB 2, Gigabit Ethernet, Wi-Fi and Bluetooth, camera and display ports, GPIO, UART, and analog video output. The CPU doesn't get off completely though. It's still in control of the GPU, SD card slot, and the new PCIe connector on the end of the board. That SD card controller doubled in performance with the Pi 4 and doubles again with Pi 5. Benchmarks of about 90 megabytes per second are pretty impressive, but my beef with SD has always been the reliability of the cards more than the outright performance. I mean, they've been slow, but I can work with slow. I can't work with a dead SD card. Fortunately, the Pi has been able to boot from other devices for a while, and I've been using a USB SSD for my Pi 4. 
You get some other things that may or may not interest you. The power button's nice. The new location of the status and power LEDs are nice. The new power management chip is great from a technical aspect, but I can't really get excited about it. The camera and display connectors have been replaced by a pair of configurable units that can be either of those, so you can connect two cameras, two displays, or one of each. You get a connector for a real-time clock battery, and you get a dedicated UART console port. That's a feature I actually care about as I don't connect mine to a video display. All of these improvements are welcome changes to the 4-year-old Pi 4. One exciting new feature is the addition of ARM's hardware crypto acceleration, boosting crypto throughput by 45 times what you would get on the Pi 4. Finally, you can use things like encrypted file systems without paying a huge penalty. That PCIe connector on the board is another great feature with caveats. To use it, you'll need an adapter board to go from the ribbon cable connector to a PCIe or M2 slot that actually connect a peripheral. And it's only one lane, so many devices you might want to connect still won't run at their full speeds. For example, even cheap NVMe SSDs will be bottlenecked by this port. And things like GPUs, if the driver's side ever gets to where they work at all, they really need 8 or 16 lanes to reach their potential. You'll max it out with a 5 gigabit Ethernet adapter, forget about 10 gig. I think most users are going to use it for an NVMe slot, and the performance should be better than a USB connected drive, but not by much. You'll just be freeing up that USB slot for other purposes. Now, the user experience, I know a lot of folks do connect these to displays and even use them as desktops. For the most part, this is a big improvement over the Pi 4. The big unknown for me is that GPU. Every time we see a new SBC, they always include the specs of the GPU, talking about its video decoding performance and the 3D acceleration specs, but that never seems to translate into actual capability when running Linux. ARM SOCs are still primarily used in the embedded space and in mobile devices running Android, and these vendors have been pretty terrible about open source drivers for their GPUs. How many reviews have you watched of some of the new single board computers with amazing performance specs and when they get to desktop performance and YouTube playback, it's painfully slow and dropping more frames than it displays. This morning's reviews of the Pi 5 show video playback at 1080p in Chromium to be pretty good and the lightweight desktop used in Pi OS to be pretty responsive. I've been unable to find driver sources for the Video Core 7 and with the track record around this, well, let's just say I'm skeptical. On paper, they do claim impressive performance, and various reviewers show things like Tuxcart and Open Arena at least playing. I think once these have been in the hands of developers for a while, we will see an improvement in game console emulation systems and video playback over the Pi 4, but it'll take a while for compatibility and stability to get there. One more thing to look at is the power consumption and heat of the new board. If you've been using the Pi 4 official power supply, well, you're going to need a new one for the Pi 5. They've upped its output from 3 to 5 amps, and now you get a low power mode if the power management chip decides your supply isn't up to the job. And that power has to go somewhere, aka gets turned into heat, so it seems heavy CPU loads will throttle it fairly quickly without some help. A passive cooler should get you about twice as long before you throttle, but if you're doing anything interesting with your new Pi 5, you're going to want a cooler with a fan. It looks like the official one is both effective and quiet, so I see no reason not to just go with that. So great. After four years, we do get a nice improvement on the Pi. What we don't get is that $25 or $35 price point, with the entry price now being $60 for the 4GB model or $80 for 8GB. I think you'll see far fewer of these sitting in drawers doing nothing, especially once you factor in the cost of a new power supply, active cooler, case, etc. But the Pi doesn't exist in a vacuum. There are alternatives, and it would be foolish to ignore them. The Pi 4 came out in 2019 and really suffered from availability problems. Scalpers were regularly reselling them for three or more times their retail costs on eBay and Amazon, and the market responded. Today, you have a dozen other vendors competing in that space, all with their own ideas on what a single board computer should be. For me, the elephant in the room is RISC-V. 
You can buy a great single board computer with a quad core 64 bit RISC V processor today. The Pi Foundation is even a member of the RISC V Foundation. So many foundations these days. But you know who isn't? Broadcom. Is there any hope for Pi to make a jump from ARM to the open source RISC V architecture? Not that I can see. I've got my eye on a few RISC V boards as potential replacements for my Pi 4 and recently got my first RISC-V powered board to start experimenting with. But beyond that, even looking at its ARM competitors, Rockchip's RK3588 series has been out since 2020 and still largely exceeds the performance of the new Pi. This chip has four ARM A76 performance cores, but also includes four A55 efficiency cores, often resulting in better performance at a lower power and heat cost. Many of these boards have exposed PCIe, NVMe, better I.O. options, and other features you just won't get on the Pi, like dedicated neural processing units for AI and eMMC storage. The Pi 5 is a great device to be sure, and a major upgrade from the Pi 4. I think as a hobbyist platform, the benefits from the community and the third-party ecosystem can be a major factor for a lot of folks. But is that enough? I don't think I'm alone in seeing the new ARM cores as a negative compared to RISC-V. Four years ago, it made sense. RISC-V was still new, and the chips you could get were at a clear performance disadvantage compared to ARM. Today, the high end of ARM still seems to be outperforming the high end of RISC-V, but that's just not the case when comparing the chips used in low-cost single-board computers. The ARM A76 is four generations old. And that's a big gap for RISC-V chips like Alibaba's T-Head TH1520 to fit in. Also, the competition in 2023 is very strong. Consider how many people use a Pi as a media playback device, retro gaming emulation, or other tasks that don't really take advantage of Pi-specific features or form factor. For the price of a Pi 5 and the necessary accessories, you can pick up a complete, brand new Intel N100-based mini-computer They'll outperform it in every aspect and have great mainline Linux kernel support. And if you're so inclined, they even come with Windows installed. If you are using things like the GPIO interfaces or value the Pi's credit card size form factor, those rock chip based boards can bring you more performance and I.O. options than the Pi 5 in the same price range. They even have higher memory configurations available as well. When the original Pi launched, they were a game changer for small form factor computing, but today you have to weigh the different options available. So where does that leave us? I'm obviously a Linux and SBC enthusiast, and I'm not sure if I'll be buying a Pi 5. Sure, the new features and performance are attractive, but they're not unique in practical ways compared to the competition. I've got my eye on two RISC-V boards right now, the Milk 5 Melees, which was announced a few weeks ago, and the Cypede Litchi Pi 4 that is available now on AliExpress. For the jobs I give my Pi 4, either would be more than sufficient, and the idea of RISC-V is way more exciting than a revision bump on the same old Broadcom ARM cores. Of course, the Pi 5 is only available today as a pre-order, and we don't have a firm date on when you might expect to actually receive one. The official release post only says October. In a world where Amazon can get you that cheap mini PC delivered tomorrow, waiting a month for a Pi or a Pi-like board might not be so attractive. That's it for this video. I'd love to hear your thoughts on the new Pi 5. Is this the update you've been waiting for, or is the competition too attractive to pass up? Is there some aspect I didn't cover that needs more attention? Let me know in the comments. If you like little Linux boxes, hardware hacking, or just electronics projects in general, come join us over at the Hackers Homestead Discord channel. We're working on some really cool projects over there. The link for that and some of the things I discussed are in the video description. If you enjoyed this video, please give us a thumbs up. And if you want to see more on these topics, it's always free to subscribe. Take care, everybody, and we'll see you in the next video.